I'm kind of skeptical at this point of who's actually doing the moving of this stock. I mean, everybody from the professionals on down knows the GameStop story now. And there are lots of people with incentive for it to move one way or the other. But all of this, does it come down to risk? I look at Tesla and Square buying Bitcoin, which is, you know, companies with stretched valuations, maybe for good reason, buying an asset that's got <laughs> a really arguably uh, stretched performance. You know, and, and, and we've got this reaction that we saw this week to the 10 year. I mean, there's a lot playing off of risk, isn't there? Yeah, without question. You know, especially when we look at all of these rises, everyone is searching for the ability to drive returns. And, you know, we've had some indicators that tell us we need to watch the Fed, see how they might work with the Treasury, and will we be in this environment where dollars will continue to flow um, We'll have to see. You know, I'm, I think right now it's time to, to just take a pause. And But long term, I think there is an opportunity to buy if we see that, you know, the pressure kind of keeps prices a little lower right now. Hey, Lo, I wonder, you know, as you try to gauge the sentiment of the Reddit community on names like GameStop primarily, but also AMC and Koss and, and BlackBerry and so forth, this notion that somehow you are able to withstand losses better than the next guy, that you're proud almost that you top-ticked a name on a certain day of trading. I guess I'm wondering, do you think that sentiment is actually genuine? And if so, what does it say about um, the retail investor's tolerance for risk right now? I think the retail investor has a very high tolerance for risk. And, you know, yes, there is a little bit of that, of that bravado, I think, that, that permeates throughout within those communities on Reddit in particular. I mean, but look, you know, there is something to be said about going out and, you know, the badge of honor, both for the wins and for the losses. Great learning experience when those losses happen. There is that leaderboard mentality. Look, we've talked a lot about the gamification and everyone recognizes that. I think that is one component. I look at it as more of a positive component because there is something to be said about being proud about making money within the stock market. People are going to go and tell their friends. I like the return of the retail investor in that sense, especially looking at millennials and Gen Z. So look, yes, that badge of honor, I think being able to tell those stories, that gets more people excited about wanting to understand the stock market. Look, you see GameStop, everyone knows the GameStop story, whether or not they've even invested. I think that's actually a good thing for the market. Yeah, and as we see these sort of ups and downs, perhaps that's the education happening in real time. Meantime, Lo, um, let's talk about the first public results for two recent uh, debuts. That would be Airbnb and DoorDash. Airbnb higher today, despite a big loss on that better than expected revenue and really an embrace of local travel by its users. Those are the catalysts there. But DoorDash, on the other hand, is going the opposite way this morning. Blowout results dampened by Tony Hsu's warning of a significant slowdown ahead. Lo, you talked about sort of short-term pressure, but the long-term story. Is that the case for a name like DoorDash that is going to be facing some really tough comps this year? Do you think that long-term story is intact, that habits have changed for good, that people are going to continue to tap delivery when the economy reopens? Yeah, look, we already saw a lot of tailwinds that were starting even prior to the pandemic. And those were accelerated once the pandemic happened. I believe DoorDash is going to face a lot of pressure, both from players like Uber because of their infrastructure and Uber Eats. And then also just, you know, consumers are fickle. I think consumers really make decisions more on a geographic basis with familiarity. You know, you think about Postmates strong in Los Angeles, DoorDash strong in San Francisco, Grub, you know, Grubhub strong in New York because they acquired Seamless. And... At the end of the day, people just want to get the brands and food they're familiar with, and whoever is going to deliver that, they'll go to. The other pressure point is really just thinking about the regulators. You know, just looking at the prospect of a consumer paying, you know, $30 for a cup of coffee, you know, the regulators have stepped in on a local level, and cities like, you know, Berkeley, San Francisco, even New York are trying to cap some of these costs. And it also really puts pressure on these small businesses trying to use these services. You know, they were pretty much mm -hmm. forced 
to be able to use the delivery services to get the food to their customers since customers couldn't dine in until things started to open back up. So that all those things are going to put some right. pressure on DoorDash, right? You've got the competition, fickle consumers, regulatory mm -hmm. pressure. You know, a lot of these larger players that partner with some of these delivery companies, you know, think the Popeyes, McDonald's, they also are negotiating a lower price on the delivery. So all that's going to put pressure on the take rate for DoorDash. And look, these are going to be tough comps. And it's not clear how much of these behaviors that we've started to see will persist long term. So, yeah, I think it's going to be tough right. to be able to really see that same growth because it's already doubled within the past year. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.